right, good evening, good evening. We're starting right at six o'clock tonight. Turn in your songbooks to 575. 575, and if you see the title, let's do what it says. Let's stand up for Jesus, all right? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. 575 tonight. All four stanzas. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. Every foe is vanquished. Had the men only on the second men. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The trumpet call obey. Lord, call the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered fools. Let It's the ladies' turn on verse 3. Stand up. Everyone stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor's song. Who him that overcometh, a crown of I shall be. be standing for prayer as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come to this place. We can open our Bibles, we can open our hymn books, and we can sing the great hymns of faith, and we can read thy word. Oh Lord, we're admonished from this song to stand up for Jesus, and I can't think of a better song for what is going on this week. Lord, there is a burden upon our hearts for our nation. We are at quite the crossroads. And Lord, we pray that Christians everywhere will stand up on Tuesday. And Lord, we're praying for your will to be done. We pray for mercy for our country. Lord, that we would not lose the liberty to meet together in a church. We would not lose the liberty of freedom of speech. Lord, perhaps the day will come when a preacher who calls sin what sin is from the Bible, they might call that a hate crime. But Lord, we must stand on the word of God. And Lord, we need to stand together even when we go to the voting house. We pray for your will to be done. We pray now for this service, that you would turn our hearts to the word of God. That we would be admonished and we might learn and we might be edified and encourage one another to live for our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, Katie. We're going to take our songbook one more time before the message, and that's hymn number 463. Would you stand together once more as we sing 463? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 463. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a forte of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Lord of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst of my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. On the last perfect submission, all is at rest, I am my Savior. His goodness lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you so much. You may be seated. In your Amen. Bibles, Old Testament tonight, 2 Kings chapter 20, 2 Kings chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible or you need to borrow one, you can grab one of the Pew Bibles, page 613, an easy one, 613, if you're not positive on your books of the Bible, and sometimes maybe struggle to figure out where is that book at, so rather than flipping through pages for a few minutes, 613 in a Pew Bible, and Second. Uh, Kings chapter number 20, 2 Kings tonight, chapter number 20. Second Kings chapter number 20. If you're not familiar with this story, this involves King Hezekiah. You can see that there in verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. So this is King Hezekiah. He's the king of what would be called at this point the southern kingdom called Judah. One of the great kings in all the Bible. Uh, just a little bit under King David there. One of the great kings. God gives great record of his life and ministry. Did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And was just a great man and leader. But here you're at the twilight of his life. Chapter 20 of 2 Kings. Says he was nigh unto death. Let's read the first seven verses. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. That's interesting. Thus saith the Lord. Now this is the prophet speaking. Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. What would you do if that was told to you by the prophet? Then he being Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore or sorely or, or deeply, lots of weeping. And it came to pass afore or before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court. So Isaiah has left and is sort of leaving the palace. And that the word of the Lord came unto him again, saying, Turn again, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord. 
the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil. And he recovered. And you're like, wow, what, a, <laughs> what an interesting miracle. Uh, he didn't necessarily hear, it doesn't say that he asked to be healed. It doesn't say that he asked for 15 years, but he certainly didn't want to die, wasn't ready to die. And he prayed and the Lord said, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I'm going to heal you and I'm going to give you 15 years to live. Now, you and I might say that is awesome. That is wonderful. And yet tonight I would ask you, what would happen if that was you? Will that 15 extra years be a blessing or a curse? You have 15. 15 years to live. Wow. And yet, would that not always hang over you a little bit? Would you not always be conscious of 12 years now, 8 years, 5 years left, 3 years left? Now we're down to 4 months, 2 months. I mean, how, how would you and I live? Maybe we'd live a little freer, saying, hey, I've had 15 more years. God promised that. I mean, I could sort of be invincible in a way, uh, maybe or maybe not. And you say, what, what are you getting at tonight? What, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out a little bit uh, the message. Well, uh, go with me then over the same chapter to verse number 12. So Hezekiah is healed. God prolongs his life and gives him 15 years to live. Unfortunately, it appears that those 15 years spoiled him, probably like it would do to most of us. It made him proud. It made him haughty. Caused him to be comfortable and complacent. And here you have a story that takes place. We're not exactly told the timing. The Bible says in verse 12, and at that time, you have a very long name there. I don't think anybody knows how to pronounce it. So Baradachdaladin, the son of Beladin, the king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. So it must not have been too long that uh, the king of Babylon sent maybe some dignitaries, some messengers with some gifts and things like that. And verse 13, and Hezekiah hearkened unto them. And he showed them all the house of, now I want you to notice all the words that say his. Show them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. So he's, he's showing these and he sounds like he's being a little vain and a little proud and sort of showing, but it says his, it's all his. And, and here comes the prophet Isaiah again. Verse 14, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, what, what said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, they are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he, that's Isaiah, said, well, what have they seen in thine house? Or literally the palace. And Hezekiah answered, all the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Everything. I showed them everything. I, I wanted to show them every single thing. I didn't keep one thing from them. Verse 16, Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Like, what? what is going on here? Our focus tonight is verse 19. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Hezekiah, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? You say, well, what, what's going on here? My uh, purpose tonight is not to dig into this deeply, but I want to use verse 19 and what Hezekiah said and what was on his heart as a uh, springboard to tonight's message that the Lord laid on my heart. What is Hezekiah's response? Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Okay, so the prophet Isaiah just gave a prophecy. He just prophesied, which we know happened, that the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonians, would be used of God as judgment on the house of Judah. And the Babylonians would come and ransack and take captives and destroy Jerusalem. We know that happened. It happened in Scripture. Nebuchadnezzar, several 
times they came into Judah and Jerusalem and ransacked and burned. And we, we know the stories of Daniel and others who were taken at Ezekiel. And they're going to take your children and make them slaves. And, and Hezekiah's response here, in other words, was, well, that's no worry to me. No worries to me. At least in my lifetime, everything's going to be good. I'm not worried about what happens after I die. Peace and truth in my life, whoa, okay, no big deal. That's okay. Then it won't affect me. And I want to use that tonight, that sort of av that cavalier attitude of, uh, as we look at tonight, the topic of just this year's election, the voting and the Christian's Guide to Voting. You say, what does that do they think? All right. You know, sometimes we, we think we're voting just for the immediate. You know, I don't have any idea who uh, anybody's going to vote for. Nor do it's not my, my uh, I don't need to know. I don't think anybody needs to know. I think that's a matter of personal liberty. I think it's a matter of uh, your freedom, your privacy as American citizen. And I would think that anybody who would any, ask anybody who you voted for, be it an election vote, be it a church vote, be it a, you know, people asking about the vaccine, I think that's private, all right? And uh, you know, a lot of times that would fall under busybody, all right? Unless someone wants to volunteer to you the information, it's not really anybody's business necessarily who they voted for. I would never ask anybody that, and I would hope nobody would need to ask me. I think it's probably clear, though, uh, what voting is. I think it's a matter of privacy as an American citizen. But we know that Election Day is Tuesday, November the 5th. We're aware of that. If you aren't aware of that, you, you must not get your mail or, uh, uh, or even watch what it would be on the television if there's anything good. All the commercials and the junk mail and the fire starters and all that stuff you get, all right, and signs that are out there and conversations and arguments and debates that we get in this time of year and thoughts and opinions. And yet, what is Hezekiah's attitude? May, may that not be the attitude of any one of us as God's people. Well, I don't know what will happen down the road or down the future, but, you know, as long as everything's okay while I'm living or as long as the next few years are fine, or as long as it doesn't impact my savings, or my bank account, or my finances, and oh well, whatever happens, happens. Maybe the Lord will come anyways, and we'll all be good. That kind of a cavalier attitude that you see with Hezekiah here, who unfortunately, those 15 years of, uh, of extra living, probably weren't the best for him. In fact, not probably. Read, read the rest of the story. Uh, it's Chronicle says his heart was lifted up. Became very proud, and he knew he had all that time, and, got, and he became vain, and we know he had a son named Manasseh, and it appears that he did not raise that son for God, because Manasseh was one of the most wicked men and kings in all the Bible, born during those 15 years. And yet, what is our duty as a citizen of the United States? So what, what is our duty as a Christian, even greater than a citizen? And we all understand, I think, but it does well that we repeat it. We know that there is no godly party. There is no righteous party when I'm talking about a political party. There is none. All right. Uh, our hope, we know, is not in America. It's not in our past history, our heritage. It's not in a person. It's not in a political party or an agenda. We know, and we should know, that our hope is in the Word of God. It's in God and His Word. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, read, read the New Testament, especially uh, after you will see very little mention of the believer and the church's response or duty to anybody ruling, all right? doesn't mean we take a blind eye and we don't vote or we don't care and we have that cavalier attitude of what we do. But you're going to see, you, you don't see a whole lot of uh, Im impact on overthrow of the Roman Empire, who the governors were, or who the, Ill, the wicked leaders were, or what was the duty of the church and the people there, and those kind of things. We, we know that our hope is in the Bible. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, the principles of the truth of the Word of God. Well, you know, one of the answers for America is in the churches. God's people, believers. So you want to turn around America? I like the quote. I don't usually uh, take, you bring my phone up here, but uh, I took a picture of a quote. didn't have time to really write it down, but uh, I like I saw this just the other day. Someone said, wouldn't it be great to have a committed Christian in the White House? And most of them say, Yes. And yet, this man's comment, I would like to suggest something else that, in my opinion, would have far greater impact. If hundreds of thousands of men seriously began to lead in their own homes, the impact on America would be far greater than one Christian man leading in the White House. We could probably say amen to that. I hope we'd say amen to that. I think we could add to that if uh, even just thousands of New Testament Bible churches did what they ought to do. We'd see a far greater impact in America than on who's in the office of the president, though that is an important office. 
and certainly a godly or someone at least who would live by Bible principles goes a long way. We know that in our history as well as in the Bible. And yet Psalm 127.1 says what? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So we can do all that we want, but unless the Lord is truly um, on the foundation and the building of America, we're not going to see much. So I hope we understand. And again, this is redundant for many of you, but I have no idea who voted. Many people vote early today, and that's fine. Absentee, early voting, nothing wrong with that. We're not interested in who voted, who didn't vote. Hopefully you will vote. That's the key. I would assume all uh, God's people will vote. Although statistics tell that 30 to 50 percent of Americans who can vote don't vote. All right. And that statistic holds true for many believers. If you, uh, you know, not all polls are on it. We don't always know the, how they get their polling, but that many believers don't vote believing that, well, to vote for both are evil, both are wicked. So it'd be better to not vote. All right. So that kind of a mentality. And certainly uh, that's between you and the Lord. But I would encourage all believers, all American citizens to vote. We have that great freedom. Most people around the world do not have that. All right. I mean, think about most other countries. I mean, if you do vote, we all know it's like a puppet vote. Are you going to vote? We all know who's, <laughs> who's going to get it anyway. There's nothing you can do about it. All right. And yet we have a, a great, we have an interesting in America, don't we? You know, many of you have this. Again, isn't this amazing? Right here, you can have a little pocket come in, the Constitution. I mean, that's it. <laughs> the Constitution of the United States. I don't know the last time you've read it. You look at it. Uh, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I don't know if that's required. Hopefully it's required reading in our schools. All right. Homeschool as well as public and Christian. But it's really not that big uh, of, of a document that is uh, what we would call an important. Now, it's not the Word of God. It's not near as important as the Word of God, but the Constitution of the United States. And uh, you read your articles and your amendments in there, and it tells you everything. W what's unique about America, of course, is we're a republic. That's, there's a difference between a republic and a democracy. All right. And uh, that we are voting for a person that can only only be in office at the most eight years. Eight years. I mean, that's it. Eight years. I mean, think about other countries. All right. Eight, eight years, maybe just four years. All right. And we have the privilege uh, to vote for a person to cast our vote uh, for the president of the United States of America, as well as senators, House of Representatives, governors, local officials, and down the list we go. And sometimes it can seem daunting or discouraging or, well, we don't know who we can trust and who knows if it's rigged or crooked and all those kind of things. And we think of other countries, yet we have the great privilege. I hope we understand we're not voting. We're not voting for a person. That's what we often, it often comes down to that. We're voting for a person, this person or this person or this picture or this picture. It, it, we're not really voting for a person or a personality or even a persona because a lot of that is a persona, right? Who, who really knows if any of that's even true? How would you even know any TV ad or anything or media or whatever? I mean, how does anybody know that? You were voting really on a party. You're really voting on a platform. We're voting on a philosophy. A direction is really what we're voting for. Um, sometimes we get caught up in the, the person who represents a particular group. Uh, and that is, yes, the leader, but there's so much more under that, uh, that the direction of which we go. And that is... The president is a, a powerful person, right? It, but, it, but it's limited in America. It's limited. We have three branches. If you read your, your uh, Constitution, the most uh, and longest detail is Article I, which is the legislative, the Congress. The second longest is the president, and the shortest, and not even that much, is the judicial. And if you read the Federalist Papers and you're in the history, you'll see that the judicial was never meant to be that powerful. It was really the least important and not even that significant. All right, now today it's been reversed, and we're like, oh, the judges, the Supreme Court. All right, but there, not even that much in there on that. It really was not considered that important. It wasn't the, the, what the Founding Fathers really focused on, uh, on all of that. And you can read, what, what is the government? What, what do we have? What about the President of the United States? The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. He shall hold his office during the terms of four years, together with the vice president chosen for the same term to be elected. Before he enter his office, he shall take the following oath. So when you vote, and this is what, in a way, you're voting on right here, this person that says this. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's, it's not who's, gonna, who's in my best interest that helps my pockets, or taxes, or not taxes, or money. In a way, that would be more like a Hezekiah. 
Oh, well, you know, what can I get out of it? I mean, sure, we, we, but none of that's really, uh, who, who's going to help what I want the most? No, the, what person is going to, to the best of their ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States? Now, we have to know the Constitution. Well, we have to know it. We have to understand it. We have to read it. We have to make sure our children understand that. We have to make sure that uh, this is what uh, is one of the things that guides our country. And then we have the rights of citizens and the different amendments that are in here in the Bill of Rights, what we have as a, a country. And then you, you can compare a lot, right? The American Revolution, and what, about 10 years later, the French Revolution. What was the difference? Big difference, wasn't there, between the two revolutions? One ended in guillotine, one did not, all right? And different, different branches, philosophies. How, and what, 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 how many, what's, what's France been like? Would you move there today? Would you want to live there? You might say, I want to visit Paris. All right, I'll get a few things there. Would you want to live there? Would you want to be a citizen? How many constitutions have they gone through since the French Revolution? All right, uh, what's it like there? What for you? I'd say, well, I don't know. And it, there's some tremendous things in the American Constitution, Declaration of Independence. I would encourage you to read it if it's been a little while. You can pick them up anywhere, no doubt, online. So the question is not, who do I like? Who do I dislike? Who do I believe? Who do I not believe? Who comes across more likable? Who comes across more believable? Who's more trustworthy? I mean, for the most of us, we'd say, well, I'm not 100% sure. I do my best to figure it out, or I look at records, or I can see voting records, if they have a voting record as a senator, if they were in positions of authority before, or certainly you could, if it's a former president like we have, you can look back on the four years, or someone that held an office in another place, and you can look at their their political party for some and determine what they hold to and believe. The question is, which party, which platform, which agenda is more in line with the Word of God? That's really what you're voting on. Which party, which platform, which agenda is more in line with the Word of God? God's precepts, God's principles. Now, for that to be true, you've got to know the Word of God. It can't be just a casual glance. It can't just come to church and listen to a preacher. You've got to know the Word of God. Uh, what does the Bible say about government? What does the Bible say about leaders? What does it say about righteousness and unrighteousness? What does it say that God loves and God hates? What are the things dear to the heart of God? I mean, you've got to know those things. You can't just base it on talking to 10 friends, listening to uh, you know, YouTube videos constantly, uh, researching books and listening to all these different things. You've got to know what does the Bible say about these kind of things. And then, based on the best of your ability, through careful prayer, diligent prayer, studying the scriptures, Prayer, decide then who you are going to vote for, or more importantly, what you're going to vote for. I'd say what is more important than who, all right? What are you voting? It's not necessarily who you're voting for, although there's usually a, a person, obviously, it's what. What party, what platform will lead our country closest to God? There, are, there is no righteous party. There may be believers, certainly. There may be some good men and women based on what we know and testimony and, and, and have heard. But even that, we're not always positive. We're not the Lord. Which party, which platform, which agenda for the next four years, possibly, will lead our country closest to God, will live closest to the Constitution of the United States, will honor the Word of God and God's precepts and principles? Which one would God greater blessing would be upon? Which one would hold back God's judgment? We know that God will judge America. We know that we deserve it. We know that already God has extended mercy and compassion. But we know that America will not be here forever. We know that if God judged today, we would deserve every bit of it. Especially God's people, the church. So the question is, well, what does God love? What does God hate? What is dearest to his heart? Which party platform is closest to that? Well, I think if you went through the scriptures, you'd see some very clear things. Uh, his son, Jesus Christ, the biblical plan of salvation, uh, God's word, the Bible, its truth, its precepts, its principles, Does, which party platform, if, if there is one, maybe not, to, would mock it the most, would use it the most. Would, again, so a lot of those things can just be done to get votes, right? Hard to know truth from error. Which party or platform best loves or supports God's chosen people, the Jews? Israel. That's pretty big, I believe, from the Bible. Which one best values God's institution he instituted in the Bible? Genesis, marriage, family, gender, one man, a male, one woman, a female for one lifetime, bearing and raising children for his glory. Which one best values that and upholds that? 
How about creation? Does God value creation, human life at conception? Which party, which platform best values and holds to what the Bible says? How about the church? Which one, if in charge, would best value uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of, to worship, freedom to do those kind of things? Which one? Those are dear to the heart of God. Study the Bible. Study your king. Study Jehoshaphat. Study the prophet that said, after he came back from Ahab, and what he said, why God sent the prophet Jehoshaphat. Uh, what are you doing? Why do you love the, those that are enemies of God and hate them? The people that, what are you doing? All right, and God's, God's warning there. I believe that you understand our country's future hangs in the balance. It's, it's not a question if, it's when will God judge America. And yet when you read the Bible, you can see that God does withhold his hand through humility, through prayer, through seeking God and when God's people. I asked some questions here, whether you voted already or you haven't voted. Which party or platform? And, and for, there's only two, really, right? You're only voting on two. There may be some independent things out there. Maybe you feel by voting for one of those you've can say, I did, at least I voted for something, that's okay. But there's only two, only one of two are going to take it. Which party platform best upholds biblical marriage and the family? You, you do your own checklist. Which party platform best upholds and values human life? As defined by the Bible. Which party and platform best honors and values parents, parental rights and parental authority in raising your children and your family? Which party and platform best values education, Christian education? and the opportunity for parents to choose what's best. Which party platform best supports Israel? Which party platform best values our nation's history and values, teaches that, and believes in that being taught? Which party or platform best honors God's words and principles, if at all? Which party and platform best values character and freedom? Which party and platform values freedom, liberty, free speech, the rights of as I mentioned, parents and those in authority, uh, national security, military, the police. Which party and platform values the Constitution, the Bill of Rights? Which party and platform has a more consistent biblical worldview? And those are the kind of questions you've got to, to ask. And maybe you say, well, I don't know, I haven't thought about those things. Maybe too late. You might have to do some serious digging and looking and finding out. And again, depending on where you look. Depend on what you find, I guess, all right? And uh, we understand what the Bible says. And God thinks about evil and sin and wickedness. We understand that most of the time the impetus is on God's people. If my people, we know that's an Old Testament verse, but it's my people. It's uh, God, sin, sin or sin, wickedness, wickedness. God's looking for God's people to, to pray, to fast, to seek God's face, to, to get back to what God says to live that way. We know that. The question is not when will God pour out his wrath? We don't know when that will be. It could be at any moment. And we would deserve it. it. might be this year. It might be next year. What if it's not for 10 years? Maybe, what if, we, what if we were told in 50 years God will judge America? Maybe we'd have the attitude of Hezekiah. Well, at least it won't happen in my lifetime. Well, at least, at least I'll, is, that, is that what we want? Is that what we vote for? Or the direction it's going? What about our children and our grandchildren? What about future generations? Will they have any part of the freedoms that some of us have enjoyed? Uh, there's much more than just right now. What, what do they promise? What can I get? What will, what will be good for the next year or two? Uh, what about down the road? What direction that we see our country go? So my question is, what are you? Not, I wouldn't go up to you and say, who are you voting for? Really, that doesn't even bother me. I wouldn't even care necessarily. What are you voting for? Not, not necessarily who. If I say, what are you voting for? When you make your votes, what are you voting? What, what is the deciding factor on what you vote for? Yes, I know it's a who. There's going to be a name. I understand that. All right. But, but what? What is the, if it comes down to, I'm not sure, I've got one final decision. What makes the difference? Uh, what are you voting for? What, what, what does it come down to? Is it what they promised? I, I can honestly tell you, and I don't know, what, how or what you vote, and many of you have voted before me, I, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever voted ever for a person or a personality. This never even seemed like that would be the point. No one even, you don't even know who they are. They can't believe just what's promoted. I've never really voted for a person or a personality. I don't think I've ever given a vote based on any rally, any stump speech, 
all right? Any ad, any TV commercial, any, any of that stuff, all right? I mean, there's no way to know if any of that's true or just politics, all right? Uh, I don't think that's what a person ought to vote on, although a lot of money is put into those kind of things, uh, little snippets, and depending on a channel you watch or a site you go to or a magazine you read or a, a person you listen to on the radio, all right? And certainly there are those that would be considered more leaning a certain direction, I would hope that we would vote and place a vote solely based on the Word of God. What does God say is important? Which one do I believe, based on prayer and study and what I've already, which one best is closest to this, if at all possible to know, then that receives my vote. All right, many times, I don't know, especially sometimes the lesser candidates. You're like, I don't know anything about them. Or sometimes a local judge where they're not giving, a, you know, I don't know, you know, and maybe you try to investigate, maybe you don't, maybe you try to ask questions. And sometimes it seems impossible, you don't really know much about them. And yes, you can get some guides, and certainly there's guides, and we've sent them out before in different places. And sometimes you can get the guides based on the, the president. There's a few back there, and we're not going to tell anybody who to vote for. Uh, this one has uh, some votes from the president, has also some of the Pennsylvania U.S. Senate. Uh, that's obviously between you and the Lord. I would encourage you to be talking about and praying about that. But you can do research. There's sites you can go to. Some are Christian based, some are conservative based, some are whatever, and you can do your determining factor. All right. I would encourage all adults, if you have children in the home, pray with your children. Uh, search the scriptures with your children. Lay the foundation with your children now, though they not, may not be able to vote one day, of why you vote and how you vote and how important voting is and, and what makes the deciding factor. And, and, and even you could say, ch children, here's, here's how we're voting and here's why. And no, I may not like this person or their persona. And you know what? Most politicians have a problem. Not all of them. There are some based on, I guess, based on uh, sometimes afterwards you can read a biography and, and sometimes hear a testimony and, and based on their values and their voting record, you can get a consistent picture of, of what at least they hold dear. All right, or certainly if they're representing their people in the area that they represent and not going with just what they want or a party or the money behind them, but a lot of it we know uh, is, is a lot of the money and the things intertwined, but certainly we can, we can investigate all we can, and sometimes you can meet somebody and you know somebody or so-and-so has met them and they're very nice and genuine, all those kind of things. And yet ultimately our, our guide is the Word of God and the Scriptures. Many times it says in Psalms uh, we can't trust in princes or we can't trust in... Uh, meaning authority. We trust the Lord God. We trust the scriptures. We, we read the word of God. We make our decision. We pray. We, we vote on those kind of things. So I want to ask you, did you, for those who already voted, or will you, for those who have yet to vote, will you diligently pray and seek God's will for the vote? Will you diligently seek God's word? What would be your principles to guide you when you vote? Maybe you say, oh, I don't need anything, it's easy, I'm going to do this this year. Well, maybe some years it seems easier than others, or maybe years where it's not so easy. Certainly we have lots of information today that maybe we didn't have in years past, and and doesn't mean that information is accurate or true, is it? And yet, most of America will vote this Tuesday at polling places throughout the country on Election Day, and we'll watch the news and watch results and decide if you can trust it or not or believe it and wonder what's going to be said anyways, and who knows and all of those kind of things. And, and we may or may not find out who will be our next president or who will be our next senator or who will be our next whatever. We may or may not. And, but it is the privilege and right, I believe, of every citizen to freely vote. And I hope every Christian will cast a vote, will not to neglect that and just say, no, it'd be better to be neutral, to not do that. And that's, if that's what you believe and you prayed sincere, that's between you and the Lord. All right, you certainly uh, have the opportunity to do that, and uh, that's what you and I will give an account for. I believe our country, though, future hangs in the balance. And I want to encourage all of us to not have the attitude of Hezekiah of, well, you know what, America may go down the dumps one day, but hey, as long as things are okay now, or for my kids, or uh, that short-term view, as long as, hey, as long as things are good, or if my finances improve, or they offer some incentives to me, hey, that's all that matters. All right, the Lord's going to come back anyway soon. That kind of an attitude, and so we don't really take seriously our duty. We don't really pray diligently. We don't really, we go with uh, maybe just newscasts or what people say or we've heard. 
And I want to encourage all believers to vote faithfully, uh, to vote righteously, to vote based on the Word of God as best you know by studying and see what the Word of God says. And again, as you're in Kings, let's turn to one reference here. And then we're going to close tonight and have a little bit of prayer prayer time uh, with our church family and uh, together uh, for our country and foreign elections. And I'm going to give a couple quick things about what do you pray for? If you'll turn over to 2 Chronicles 7, 2 Chronicles, you're in 2 Kings, so just going to flip over two books, all right? 2 Chronicles 7, and again, we realize that in its context, this is God speaking to King Solomon, king of all Israel. But God does give some principles here, some of which are repeated in the New Testament. We know that my people here is Israel, but and we're not in any way saying the church is Israel, but there's certainly some truth here that God says throughout the word of God. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, God does give a promise to Solomon as king, as the leader and he says, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, now here he's speaking of the nation of Israel, God's people, the Jews, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and God says, here's my promise, then will I hear from heaven. So we could say then that if we're not going to do that, God doesn't hear. We can pray all we want. God won't hear. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their, heal their land. Now, that's, you'd have to read verses before and after it, and God gives more than that. So, again, that's Israel. doesn't necessarily apply directly to the church, but we can certainly take Bible verses, Old Testament and New Testament, and see that God values humility. We know that pride goes before a fall. All right? And by, by the way, if any person running for office... Um, is this like a Hezekiah is vain or excessively proud or whatever or you and I are the Bible principle that uh, pride goes before destruction. I mean, God can chasten us for our pride. God can chasten that. All right. We certainly I think would all love to see all of our candidates be humble. All right. Be, be honest, be humble uh, to before the Lord to recognize that any office or position Anything is from the Lord, not like Hezekiah. Look at my stuff. Look at all mine. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. All right, to recognize, no, that my life, my health, my anything is the Lord's, and to show that humility. I think all of us would wish that for any of our leaders here in America, and we certainly have had some like that and can have that in the future. So may you and I, as God's people today, the church, the local church right here at Independent Bible Church, may you and I, I hope, exercise our right as American citizens to cast our vote or votes on this coming Tuesday. How many of you are going to be voting maybe for the first time? Do we have anybody that passed that? Is McKenna one over here? All right, don't be distracted by the, the sirens. That's okay. All right, maybe some of you say, yep, for the first time, I'm going to get an opportunity. That's a great privilege, all right, uh, to cast a vote as an American citizen, realizing that most of the world does not get to do that in any way, form, or fashion. And that's something uh, pretty unique for America, not that other countries don't do that. And I would encourage you to be spending a lot of time uh, privately, as a family, if at all possible, uh, having family altar, family devotions, not just because of the election. Your kids will be like, what are we doing this for? We don't ever do this, all right? Now, it's okay if you say, well, we're going to start doing this regularly, all right? But to spend some time going before the Lord. And now here would be the question. I hope your children would ask you, Mom and Dad, well, what are we supposed to, what are we praying for? All right, Lord, we pray that, you know, a lot of Christians would struggle. What are we going to pray for? If we pray tonight, if you come and pray Monday night, if you come pray Tuesday morning before work, you know, what are we going to say? Is it just going to be a, a cliche? All right, Lord, we're praying that you would, you know, a lot of people would have trouble filling in the blanks. What are we praying for exactly? How are we praying for America? Uh, what are we praying for God to do? Uh, is God going to hear that prayer? Is that prayer I'm praying based on the word of God? Do I need to pray about that? Does God say, no, this is, what am I praying for? So tonight, we're going to spend about just 10 minutes here uh, till 7.05. We're going to spend about 10 minutes in prayer. And we're praying specifically tonight. Now, that can be, for, as you, if you'd like to just pray as an individual, that's perfectly fine. All right. I uh, love when God, the church prays corporately. I think that's biblical. I think that's important. Again, we've said before, I know not everybody's comfortable with praying with someone else. And that's certainly your, your right and your choice if you say, no, thank you, or I don't feel well tonight, or I'm just going to pray by myself. All right. Uh, but I would encourage you tonight, again, you can pray with your spouse. You can look around and say, hey, I'm by myself. I see someone over there. I'll go say, be okay if we pray together. And uh, to, pray to, to pray out loud 
for America, to pray for our leaders, to pray for the elections, to pray for right, for truth, to prevail, uh, to pray. We know that God sets up kings and sets down kingdoms all through the Bible. And maybe you say, God, we know what we deserve, but we're praying for your mercy. God, we know that we deserve this, but we're praying for your, Lord, help, you know, what? You, you have to know what to pray for. And you may struggle with that. It may be a challenge for you. You may find yourself just praying vain repetitions of phrases you've heard other people say over the years when it comes to elections and just quotes and little phrases. But uh, much to pray for, the Bible says. In Timothy, we should pray for those in authority, government officials, those that are kings, those kind of things. We should be pray for right to be done, for truth to prevail, for God to have mercy, for all of God's people to be voting. Lord, if there's any of God's people that are undecided or have made a decision to not vote, God, work in their hearts. Show them how important this is. Lord, if there's someone that, I mean, there's a lot of ways that we can pray. And certainly we want to pray for ourselves as well. Pray for, to have the right spirit. Uh, pray for us as believers to, to be bold for the truth, but to have the, the spirit of, of the right manner of that. To, to share Christ even in all of this. To have the right spirit even when a month from now the election's over. Then what? All right, I mean, there's much to pray for, uh, for our country and for America. So we're going to take about 10 minutes in prayer. And, uh, and then at that point, we'll come on up here and uh, maybe Bethany just slip her up, up here right about 7.05. You'll hear a few, uh, a few uh, melody there on the piano and you can wind down your prayer. And again, 10 minutes of prayer, I know that's not much, but uh, we'll do that as a church tonight. We we'll encourage you to pray tonight at home. And then again, the church will be open tomorrow night, 7 to 8. And then also 6.30 to 8.30, two hours on election morning, all right? So uh, if you want to pray with your family, your children, that's great. Uh, you look for a friend, you want to pray by yourself, you want to pray at the front, kneel, however you want to do that. Let's go before the Lord as a church family and spend some time in prayer for our country, for the election here, the votes that are coming up here in the next two days. All right. Amen. We're going to conclude in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. I pray for each one that's here, those watching by way of live stream, Lord, that anyone that is an American citizen that has the opportunity to vote would understand the importance of voting here, Lord, as a citizen, the freedoms we have. Lord, I pray that we would spend much time in prayer searching the scriptures. I pray that we would vote, Lord, based on the word of God and what's clearly revealed. Lord, we're trusting you that you would allow this election, Lord, to, uh, Lord, there would be, the truth would prevail, righteousness would prevail as close to the scriptures, the Bible truths. Lord, we pray there would be a clear and free election, that there would not be any crookedness or anything, Lord, that would hinder that. Pray that you would cause anyone that would try to do that, Lord, to be found out, that folks could vote and trust that their vote counts. Lord, we pray we'd be in the spirit of humility, Lord, not just now for this election, but always, Lord, that you would help us as a church to understand, Lord, that's important to know things about our country, but our citizenship is in heaven. Lord, one day you're the king, you're going to rule, and Lord, I pray we'd be busy building Lord, what you've told us as a church, sharing the gospel, making disciples, and Lord, doing what you've called us to do until you come again. We thank you for each one here today. Give us a safe trip home. Help us, Lord, I pray for this country. May you bring America to its knees, God's people, Lord, in a spirit of humility, a spirit of prayer, a spirit of seeking you, Lord. And we thank you that you have promised that when we seek you with all of our heart, you will be found. We ask your blessing now tonight and as we head home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you are dismissed.